Hello, thank you again for returning to the um, Festive Spirit blog hop posted by Francis H. Powell. At this point, I have no idea what day I'm on. I think we are on 21st of December, but I really can't remember. I am uh, reading Chapter 10 now, and then I will be posting a second video of Chapter 11, along with a featured author of the day. So here I go. The forge glowed white from the constant heat of Colon's flame. Beads of sweat poured down her brow as she studied the endless stream of sade flowing from her hands. The smith gave another gust from the bellows, forcing air into the small pipe that fed the heat in Colon's flames. Keep top last, the spirit said, and gave the bellows another squeeze. Almost there. How are you holding up? Ailey asked through the heat. The young scribe maintained his distance, ensuring that Latha and Gare kept theirs. The boys sat pressing their faces into the fenced barrier, peeking hungrily between the spokes. For the moment, they seemed far more interested in Colin's sade fire than the forge itself. Despite having to squint against the blinding yellows and whites mirrored on the white stone that made up Lorlenolin, the boys had sustained their audience well for the past three hours. I'll make it, Colin said, battling through the exhaustion that endlessly sapped her strength. Her neck had stiffened, but it was nothing compared to the burning ache in her arms and shoulders from standing at Uthbert's forge for more than half a day. We're almost there, Uthbert said, sending another blast of air into the fire. A few more degrees, and we'll have an elding ingot on our hands. The status encouraged Colin to bear in, sending a refreshed surge of sade flame into the forge. Lady Gudrun, couldn't you just use your sade? Gerd asked, unable to look away from Colin's flame. The old woman seated in the chair behind Colin snorted at the suggestion. I could, she said, but if she ever wants to improve her own sade, then there's no better teacher than endurance. And so, Colin, Gudrun leans closer. Endure it! You're almost there, Colin, Aleph said over the fire's roar. You can do it. Of course you can, Gudrun scolded. I'm a damn good teacher if I do say so myself. Come on, Colin, Uthbert said. One more should do the trick. Colin bore down, focusing the last of her energy into the forge, and Uthbert grinned. There we are, he said. All right, Colin, you're done. On cue, Colin extinguished her flame and dropped her stiff arms. She swayed, taking in the extent of her exhaustion. Easy now, Gudrun said, standing up from the chair. Here. Gudrun withdrew a small apple from her pouch. Get this down now. Sunlight struck the fruit as Gudrun handed it to Colin. A thin layer of purest gold seemed to make up the pea apple skin. But when Colin sank her teeth into the flesh, the fruit snapped like an ordinary apple. At once, the ache from her arms and backs dissipated. The severe weakness gave way to renewed strength. With every bite, her strained muscles rewove themselves, leaving her feeling as if she hadn't just spent fourteen hours heating Uthbert's forge. Colin wiped the sweat from her forehead, leaving a streak of soot smudged across her brow. How does it look, Uthbert? Colin asked as the smith used a hammer and his tongs to pry off the bricks and baked mud from the forge that encompassed the mold within. The boys were at their limit. After sitting for so long, they leapt up and scrambled around the forge, and Uthbert barely keeping at safe distance. Gah, Latha! Aleph warmed, and followed the boys ready to enforce their boundaries. From the forge's belly, Uthbert pulled a single white crucible from the furnace. He furrowed his brow as he rested the crucible on the edge of the forge. Did it get hot enough? Latha said as Uthbert smashed the ashen clay crucible away to reveal a bright yellow ingot that glowed like the sun. Well, Uthbert said and shifted the ingot to an anvil beside the forge. He struck the ingot hard, so almost no slag jumped from the hot metal. He struck it again, then proceeded to hammer the ingot, forcing it to conform and stretch to his design. It looks that way, Uthbert said. In a couple of days, Colin, you'll have an elding war dagger on your hands. What do you name it? Blotan, Colin said, unable to hold back a grin. Blood tooth, Uthbert translated and smiled at his work. Already the ingot looked elongated. Is that your father's sense of humor in you? He asked, shoving the metal back into the furnace. Colin raised her hands and gave the furnace another brief blast until Uthbert grunted. Good, he returned the metal to the anvil. It's only fitting, Colin said, resisting the urge to bounce on the balls of her feet. His sword is blood here. Mine should be blood thon. Where is your father anyway? Elif asked over Uthbert's hammering. I'm surprised he isn't here to see this. Colin watched the ingot clamped in Uthbert's tongues. He went with Dagon and Eric, she said. They're making a run to the keep. What for? Gudrun asked. An inspection isn't due for another moon. Uthbert struck the ingot, stretching the hot metal into what started to resemble a flat strip. With the constant threats from King Rune, Father wanted to be sure that the king keep is armed and ready. And you're not with him? Elif asked. Colin shrugged. It's not a fight, it's just a standard troop check. Besides, you need the training, Gudrun grumped. The twinkle in her eye assured Colin she was in for a fight. I'm not half bad, she said to her grandmother. You can also do better, Gudrun replied, goading the argument from Colin. 
Colin's mouth was agape, ready to rebut, when the sudden stomp of a horse's hooves pounded the white stone of the courtyard. Colin and Ailey jumped and looked to the worn rider, the forge forgotten. From atop Astrid, the king's horse, Arik, stood down with troubled eyes. A fresh cut seeped blood down his tattooed left arm. Arik? Colin asked, perplexed at the large figure and his unprecedented arrival. It's your father, Arik said. There's been an ambush. The high summer sun beat down as the wind burned Cullen's ears. Astrid's hooves struck the ground, and she snapped the reins, urging the horse on through the barren fields to the outpost at the edge of the forest. Within minutes, the Dorkafar keep was in sight, and with it the swarm of Lyasipos surrounding Dagon, who battled them alone. At his feet lay dead the two dozen that had accompanied Dagon and King Eolf that morning. Pulling Astrid to a stop, Cullen slid from the dark reddish-brown horse and strode to the raid ahead. Only a handful remained. The ring of her blade announced her arrival and attracted the first of her enemy. Tightening her grip on the hilt, Cullen raised her elding sword and pivoted as Eliasopha brought down his blade. She blocked and sunk her blade into the soldier. Cullen caught a flash of steel. With heavy thud, he dropped to the ground. She had no time to study the frozen fear that peered up from the lifeless young face before another charged her, as eager as the last to boast of Sekona's death. With careful calculation that allowed her to predict their actions, she dodged each swing. Colin plunged her sword into another warrior who fell to the ground. She scanned the field, assessing the number left standing as she raised her sword and charged. Dagon, Colin called to the red-headed mammoth. Where's father? With a sword raised for the blow, a Leosifer charged Dagon. I saw him go into the keep. The captain shouted back over the clang of Leosifer iron against Dokafar elding steel. Colin gave her blade a final thrust as the life withered from a Leosifer. Withdrawing her sword, she turned and sank the blade into a Leosifer, preparing to throw his spear. Over-eager pride blanketed his face as the spear and slumped to the ground. Another Leosifer charged as the salt from Cullen's sweat burned her lips. With axe raised, he set his interests on the Sidkona, whose sword remained buried in the soldier's chest. Turning up her wrist, Cullen pulled from the energy produced in her core. Save flame burst to life in her hand, and she fired, catching the Leosifer on a torrent of flame, all before his blade could cleave her head in two. His screams lasted as long as his stubborn refusal to relinquish his weapon. She held him there until he released the axe. Cullen extinguished her saith as she sent as the scent of roasting flesh churned her stomach, and the charred body slumped to the ground. The final wave of soldiers charged with weapons raised. Leaving the blade to rest in the spearmen, and with both palms ablaze, Cullen brandished her arms and unleashed her saith. Like dual whips, her fire cut the air, searing a spearman to the far right, while behind him another advanced, ceasing her fire. Cullen reclaimed her sword and turned in time to plunge the blade into an advancing warrior. There! Cullen cried as Eliasopher lunged, but Dagon had already seen the last of them, who had taken off on horseback. His arm bed bearing her father's crest glistened in the sun's light as the captain mounted Cullen's horse, intent on pursuing the rider into the forests bordering Midgard. Cullen's broken breath unsettled the silence that stretched over the dead as she took in the carnage. Systematically, she assessed the many faces lying in pools of their own blood. Father? The rustling wind rolling over the bodies was the only answer, confirming the onslaught of troops had ended. Cullen stood the, stood at the tall stone tower beside her. Father, she called again, remembering Eric's report. It was just a routine inspection. We weren't ready. We didn't even see them coming. Eric had rushed through the update as Cullen mounted her father's horse. Dagon and your father were holding them off well enough on their own, but there's no telling if more are right behind them. Go on ahead. I'll go to the warmen, she had said. We'll be right behind you. But there were no warmen. Pushed up visibly by the wind, the door of the keep clanked against the stone, and flexing her grip on the hilt, Colin brandished her sword and vanished into the darkness.